Today I'm going to tell you all about a Renaissance Pope who was kind to Jews, a Roman Catholic priest and martyr who sadly died, well, was executed in Elizabeth's reign. I'm also going to tell you about an actor who was a friend of William Shakespeare and a Welsh bishop who supported the use of the Welsh language. On the 11th of March, 1513, Giovanni di Lorenzo de' Medici was proclaimed Pope Leo X after being elected on the 9th of March. He was crowned Pope on the 19th of March and held the office until his death by pneumonia on the 1st of December, 1521. He was one of the leading Renaissance popes. Giovanni was the second son of Lorenzo de' Medici, or Lorenzo the Magnificent, a member of the prominent banking and political Medici family and ruler of the Republic of Florence. Of his papacy, the Encyclopedia Britannica writes, he made Rome a cultural centre and a political power, but he depleted the papal treasury and by failing to take the developing reformation seriously, he contributed to the dissolution of the Western church. Leo excommunicated Martin Luther in 1521. Here are a few pieces of trivia about Pope Leo X. It was Pope Leo X who granted the title Defender of the Faith to Henry VIII in 1521 after the English king had published a treatise against Martin Luther. He was a patron of Raphael. He was head of the church as Pope, ruler of the Papal States, and head of the ruling family of Florence, so a powerful man. He practiced nepotism to secure his power. He was succeeded by Pope Adrian VI, who was only Pope from January 1522 to September 1523. And then Leo's cousin, Giulio di Giuliani de' Medici, was elected as Pope, becoming Pope Clement VII. As well as Raphael, he was a patron to a number of scholars and poets. Scottish philosopher David Hume described Leo as one of the most illustrious princes that ever sat on the papal throne. Humane, beneficent, generous, affable, the patron of every art and friend of every virtue. The Jewish Encyclopedia notes that Leo was very favourable for the Jews in general and for the Jews of Rome in particular, and that in a bull issued in 1514, he expressed his desire that the rights of the Jews should be respected, and he repealed an edict making the Jews of certain places wear a special badge. In 1518, he allowed a Hebrew printing press to be established in Rome. And in 1519, he remitted certain taxes, granted an amnesty for crimes committed by Jews, and ruled that Jews from then on should only be condemned by evidence given by trustworthy witnesses. A rather interesting Pope. Moving on to the 12th of March. On the 12th of March, 1564, in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, Roman Catholic priest and martyr Christopher Bales was baptised in Coniscliffe in County Durham in the north of England. Bales ended up being executed on the 4th of March 1590. Let me tell you a bit more about Bales and how he came to this sad end. Christopher Bales was the son of John Bales and his wife Catherine. He came from a Protestant background and it's not known what led to him entering the English College, a Catholic seminary at Reims in France in June 1581. He went on to enter Rome's English College in October 1583, but returned to Reims in 1584 due to ill health. Bales was ordained as a priest in March 1587 and sent back to England on a mission of conversion in November 1588. It's thought that he worked in London and that he used the names Rivers, Evers and Mallet. It wasn't long before Bales was apprehended by the famous priest finder Richard Topcliffe and imprisoned at Bridewell and then in the gatehouse. Topcliffe interrogated and tortured him by racking him 
and also by suspending him by the hands for up to 24 hours at a time. Bales was found guilty of treason under the 1585 Acts Against Jesuits and Seminary Priests for being ordained abroad and coming to England on a mission. At his trial, Bales asked the judge whether Saint Augustine, who was sent to convert the Saxons, was also therefore a traitor. But he was still condemned. He was executed in Fleet Street on the 4th of March, 1590, under a placard stating that he was being punished for treason and favouring foreign invasion. Two others, Taylor Nicholas Horner and Alexander Blake, were executed at Smithfield and Gray's Inn Lane, respectively, on the same day for helping and harbouring him. And moving on to the 13th of March the 13th of March, 1619. That was when actor and star of Shakespeare's Lord Chamberlain's Men and the King's Men, Richard Burbage, died aged 50. He was named in Shakespeare's will of 1616 as a fellow, meaning a close friend or colleague. Let me give you a few facts about this Elizabethan actor. We don't know Richard Burbage's date of birth, but he was baptised at St. Stephen's Church in Coleman Street in London on the 7th of July, 1568. And baptisms were usually done a few days after birth. He was the son of James Burbage and his wife, Ellen Brain. In 1576, Richard's father, James, also an actor, opened a theatre just outside the north wall of the City of London in Shoreditch. It was called The Theatre. It's believed that Richard began his own acting career at the age of 16 in 1584, the same year that Henry Carey, Lord Hunsdon, became patron to his father, James. In 1590-1591, Richard was listed as playing two main parts in a play called The Seven Deadly Sins, performed by Lord Strange's company. In 1594, Richard also came under the patronage of Lord Hunsdon, who is now Lord Chamberlain to Elizabeth I. Richard was the leading actor of Hunsdon's company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, based at Richard's father's theatre in Shoreditch. In the 1570s, Lord Leicester's men, led by James Burbage, visited Stratford-upon-Avon, so William Shakespeare may well have seen and met the Burbages then. Shakespeare arrived in London in the late 1580s and lodged in Shoreditch, and soon a friendship was forged between Shakespeare and Richard. As I said, in his will of 1616, Shakespeare named Burbage. In fact, he named only three men, referring to them as fellows, which meant a good friend or colleague. The Lord Chamberlain's men, including Richard and William Shakespeare, played two comedies over the Christmas period of 1594-1595 at the Royal Court at Greenwich. And in 1598, the two men acted in Ben Jonson's Every Man in His Humour. In 1596, following problems with the lease for the Shoreditch Theatre, the Burbages moved to Blackfriars and James and Richard's brother Cuthbert began work on a building there to make it a roofed playhouse for all year round entertainment, probably helped by Peter Street. The Shoreditch Theatre had been open air. Sadly though, James died in 1597, leaving the theatre unfinished. There was also opposition to the Blackfriars Theatre from local residents, so the project kind of came to a standstill. Richard and Cuthbert rented the Curtain Theatre in Shoreditch for a time before embarking on a project on Bankside in Southwark with Peter Street, using materials from the former Shoreditch Theatre. This theatre, this new theatre, became the Globe Theatre. One of the first plays to be performed by the Lord Chamberlain's men at the Globe was Johnson's Every Man in His Humour in autumn 1599, with Richard playing a leading part. Richard married Winifred Turner sometime before autumn 1601, and the couple had eight children together. Sadly, only one, William, probably named after Shakespeare, survived childhood. In May 1603, following the accession of King James I, the former Lord Chamberlain's Men Company of Players became the King's Men. Its members included both Richard and William Shakespeare. 
In late 1612, early 1613, the company gave 20 performances at court and eight of them were written by Shakespeare. In 1613, a fire broke out during a performance of William Shakespeare's Henry VIII at the Globe and the theatre burnt to the ground. It was, however, rebuilt a year later. In 1614, the company performed John Webster's The Duchess of Malfi at Blackfriars and then at the Globe, with Richard playing Ferdinand. On Saturday the 13th of March 1619, Richard Burbage died. He was 50 years old. He was buried on the 16th of March at St Leonard's Shoreditch. His wife Winifred went on to marry a Richard Robinson in 1622 and she died in 1642. Richard and Winifred's surviving son, William, is last mentioned in the records in 1647 in a land sale. Here is a funeral elegy on the death of the famous actor, Richard Burbage, who died on Saturday in Lent, 13th of March, 1619, by an anonymous poet. He's gone, and with him what a world are dead, which he reviewed to be revived so. No more young Hamlet, old Hieronimo, kind Lear, the grieved Moor and Moor beside, that lived in him have now forever died. And playwright Thomas Middleton wrote, Astronomers and stargazers this year write but of four eclipses five appear. Death interposing Burbage and their staying hath made a visible eclipse of playing. And then finally, on the 14th of March, 1553, In the reign of King Edward VI, Arthur Bulkley, Bishop of Bangor, died at his home in Bangor. He was buried in the cathedral choir. Bulkley, who was originally from Beaumaris in Anglesey, had been bishop since 1541. Here are a few facts about him. He was born in around 1495 and studied both canon and civil law at Oxford. He served as chaplain to Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk in the early 1530s before moving into the service of Thomas Cromwell, but he fell out with Cromwell in early 1537. Bulkley was the first resident Bishop of Bangor and the first to come from North Wales. In 1542, he instructed his priests to use Welsh rather than English in their sermons. He appears to have embraced reform. His library contained humanist works, and at his death, he bequeathed two English Bibles to his cathedral. Well, that's it for this week. You can subscribe to this channel by clicking around about there, I think it is. You can give me a like and leave me a comment, and please remember to hit the bell to be notified as my videos go live. Take care. Bye.